Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are moving along uh, through our Lenten journey, and we're continuing a series that we started last Sunday, looking at this theme of the day of the Lord, or the need for the day of the Lord to come, when basically God comes with his goodness and confronts our evil in the world. And we see that ultimately, the ultimate day of the Lord where that justice is poured out is when Jesus, the the true Son of God, God himself is hanging on the cross for our evil and our sin. And we're we're moving forward through the Bible, uh, sort of looking at this need for Jesus to come. And last week we looked at at, at the the story of, of the Tower of Babel where God's people were trying to make a name for themselves. They were trying to be great in their own name without God. So God caused them all to speak this different, these different languages and scattered them across the earth. He brought his day to, to humble them and, and hopefully get them to once again trust in him. And we're kind of flying through the Bible really fast here. So we're, we're going we're gonna to zoom through a little bit more of the scriptures. I'm going to do the whole rest of the book of Genesis in about one minute here. So, so get ready, right? So from there, God calls a man by the name of Abram and says, hey, I'm going to make you a great father, a father of many nations, and you're going to have a lots and lots of kids. And through, through your, your nation, through your family, I'm going to bless the entire earth problem is Abram can't have a son and he waits and he waits and he waits until he's about the age of a hundred years old and finally he has Isaac and then Isaac has a son by the name of Jacob and then Jacob has 12 sons and one of the sons of Jacob is a guy by the name of Joseph and there's a whole other long story with all the 12 sons uh, of, of Jacob but but long story short Genesis in about 45 seconds here Joseph ends up in Egypt, and he's there in Egypt, and Egypt is about to go through a huge famine. In fact, the the whole earth, kind of, that whole region is about to go through a huge famine. So God uses Joseph, this descendant of Abram, to bless Egypt, to bless the world as he helps them walk through this famine. And as we get to the end of the book of Genesis, everything is good in Egypt. God is fulfilling his promise that he made to Abram. God's people are are, are multiplying. They're, they're, They're becoming increasingly fruitful and they're blessing the world and things are good in Egypt. And we get to the beginning of the book of Exodus, which is the second book of the Bible. We kind of pick up right there. And we didn't read this in our reading, but one verse before our reading, this this is what it says. But the people of Israel were fruitful and they increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. What we see is this is what what God's people do. God, 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 God increases them greatly. They become increasingly fruitful and it's good. Right? And in the gospel reading that, that I just read kind of picks up on that theme. This is this is much, much, much later in world history. But Jesus is there, and he's, he's asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they're saying, well, well, you know, all sorts of these different answers. But then he looks at them and says, well, who do you say I am? And that's when Peter stands up. He says, well, I know, I know. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the, the Son of the living God. And, and, and to them, that was a huge statement. It meant he was the one that was going to bring God's goodness into the world. He was the one that was going to cause God's people to be increasingly great and and probably overthrow this evil Roman government and make everything good. That's, That's exactly how we're feeling as the book of Exodus begins. It looks like God has dealt with evil that God is using this this nation of Israel, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph to bless the entire world. Things are good. God is causing his people to be increasingly fruitful, and it's good until we get to the very next verse. And that's the verse that Eric read for us in our Old Testament reading. Right after he said they were becoming increasingly fruitful, this is the next verse. Verse 8 in Exodus chapter 1. 
Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And this new king over Egypt, he did not know Joseph's God either. And all of a sudden, things go from being very increasingly fruitful to, to not being very good. And we find out a, a couple chapters later in Exodus chapter 5, when Moses goes to this king and says, let God's people go, this is what he says to Moses. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. Another way to translate that line right there, I do not know the Lord, is I do not acknowledge the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. All of a sudden, we have this king that is ruling in the world that does not acknowledge the Lord. He does not know the God of Joseph. And he still wants to make his name exceedingly great, but all of a sudden he starts looking at all of these Hebrews that are living in Egypt and sees them as a threat. He's afraid that they're going to join up with all of their enemies and, and overtake the Egyptians. And his goal, this king's goal, is to make himself exceedingly great. He doesn't acknowledge the ways of the Lord. He doesn't acknowledge the Lord. So what does he do? This is what he says. He says, well, come, let us deal shrewdly with them, them being the Hebrews, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out and they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land, let us deal shrewdly with them. And if you've seen any of these Exodus movies, you kind of know what happens, right? He forces them to become slaves and, and make more bricks and make more bricks and make more bricks. And then he gets threatened by the Hebrew boys that are growing up and he issues a decree that, that every single Hebrew boy shall be murdered so that he can make himself, he being Pharaoh, can make himself exceedingly fruitful. And once again, we see evil running rampant in the world. Because there is a leader who is trying to make himself exceedingly fruitful and not acknowledging the way of the Lord. And I think we see this too with Peter from our New Testament reading, our gospel reading. You know, Peter has, has just looked at Jesus and said, you're the, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah, you're the one that's going to make us great, you're the one that's going to cause us to become exceedingly fruitful, you're going to overthrow the government, he was probably thinking. And then Jesus starts talking about the way of God. That, that, that Jesus is going to have to suffer and die on a cross. And how does Peter respond? No. That's, that's not my way, Jesus. That's, that's not our way. You're going to be the king. You're going to be the Messiah. No, you're not going to die. And then what does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Right? Right? You don't have on your mind the things of God, but rather you have on your mind the things of man. He doesn't get the ways of God. He's defining what's good in his own eyes. He's trying to make himself and his band of followers exceedingly great in his own eyes. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, you evil accuser. You just don't get it. And as I reflected over these stories this week, I think so many times we can paint evil Pharaoh out to be this evil guy, but I think so many times we do that, right? We don't acknowledge the ways of our God or we twist the ways of our God to, to, to make ourselves exceedingly great. And if you're saying, no, 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 I, I, I don't do that. Well, let me give you an example from my life uh, this past week where I saw this in action. I saw somebody trying to make themselves exceedingly great at the expense of somebody else, not following the ways of their God. And I can say I, I saw it in my very own household with my two-year-old son. <laughs> it was, I, I see it every day with my two-year-old son. But, but um, we, we always play outside with our neighbors. And we have a two-year-old son. Our neighbors across the street have a two-year-old son and this week, uh, we made a gigantic pile of bubbles. Uh, not, uh, not bubbles. We made a gigantic pile of leaves, and they were jumping in the leaves. And my son there, he had this little blower that was this bubble machine blower that he loved. He was in 
to the bubble machine. And he was, he was in charge of bubble machine domination, and he was having a great time. He was exceedingly great with his bubble machine blower until guess what happened? The two-year-old across the street took it out of his hands. And all of a sudden, we had a two-year-old crisis. My son's dream that day, right? The very impulsive, right? It's, sometimes I feel like it's trying to domesticate a little cave person, but, but we're, we're getting through it. But, but his dream that day was for bubble machine domination, which, which he had right there. This was taken about five minutes before this, this happened. This, this was, I took this picture five minutes before this happened. That was his dream to have that. And all of a sudden, the little two-year-old boy across the street killed his dreams. He was not exceedingly great at the bubble machine domination. So we were sitting about 20 yards away in the driveway watching them play. And before we could get it, my son had just lost his bubble machine and he defined what was right in his own eyes. And obviously, if a two-year-old steals your bubble machine and dethrones you from bubble machine domination, it means you have to get it back. And how you do that in a two-year-old's mind is you look down and you see your little toy rake that's about this long, that's plastic, and you pick it up and you wallop the guy that, that took your bubble machine over the back of your head, and you pick up the bubble machine and you start blowing bubbles again. <laughs> and that all happened in the amount of time it took me to jump up out of my chair and run about 20 feet to go put justice back into the situation. Let's just put it that way. In his mind, he was doing what was right. In his mind, picking up a rake and walloping another kid over the back of the, back of the body with a rake m made sense. And, and everybody, no, no kid was harmed in the making of that, that story there. It, everybody was okay. We're, we're still all friends. It, 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 it's good. But we do the same thing, don't we? Right? We, we maybe don't have on our mind the, the, the idea of bubble machine domination, but, but maybe we want to make ourselves exceedingly great. And rather than acknowledge the ways of our God, what do we do? We, 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 we don't follow those ways, and we sort of try to get to those ways at the expense of other people. We're like a bunch of two-year-olds. Really, we, we are. Right? Maybe you, in your life, like I said, you don't see it for bubble machines. Maybe you love bubble machines and you do stuff like that. But, but maybe for you, it, it's more serious. Maybe for you, you see it in your relationships, whether it be a marriage or a relationship with a friend. And all of a sudden, that relationship gets a little bit strained. And all of a sudden, you get upset with your friend. And, and, and you hear the word of the Lord that's out there that says, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, turn the other cheek, you're like, eh, not for me and so-and-so, right? It'd be so much easier to just kind of phase that friend out of my life, then I don't have to deal with them anymore. I can get back to making myself exceedingly great. So we phase them out. We don't acknowledge the ways of our God. Right? We, we, we do this with our politics all the time. And I don't want to pick on any particular political party because uh, we do it with, with, with all political parties and everything in between, right? So many times what we do is we listen to our party of choice more than what our God says. We define what's good and evil by what they say and we try to twist God's word to fit that rather than listening to what God says. Where is it in your life? that you're twisting what God says to fit your own agenda, to make yourself exceedingly great, to try to get yourself back to complete and utter total bubble machine domination at the expense of picking up a rake and hitting whatever is in your way. We do that. Where is that in your life? And, and we see that's exactly what Pharaoh is doing. Pharaoh is there getting rid of everything that's in his way, and, and he's murdering... <laughs> Basically, these immigrants that are in his midst. Peter, he doesn't get it. He doesn't get the ways of his God. He, he, wants, he wants to make Jesus exceedingly fruitful. So when Jesus starts talking about dying, he says, no, Jesus, that's not supposed to be the right way. And Jesus says, no, get behind me, Satan. Stop trying to make yourself exceedingly fruitful because that's not the way of God. Right? We, we see that Jesus... If, if that was the way of God, Jesus could have had it easy. Right when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, 
what did Satan offer him? Satan says, you can have all of these kingdoms, right? If you just bow down and worship me. Hey, Jesus, your father in heaven, he's saying you got to go through a cross. Not me, right? Just bow down and worship me. You can be exceedingly great. You can have all of these things. But what does Jesus say? No. Right? He says, isn't it written? He goes back to the word of God. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Right? He goes back to God's word. He, he, he completely follows the will of the Father. And the will of the Father is to, to come and suffer and die for you and me. The people that are like Peter, the people that are like Pharaoh, that, that bring about that evil in our world. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He dies on the cross for you. He experiences the day of the Lord. He experienced the, the justice of the Father jumping out of his chair, trying to come get the rake out of his hand, as we're, out of our hand, as we're trying to go for complete bubble machine domination. He takes it on himself so that you are forgiven and I am forgiven. And he gives us the keys to his kingdom as he's raised in his resurrection. So as we live in a world where we are trying to become exceedingly fruitful, well, stop. Pause. And when you do at the expense of others, well, turn to Jesus because he's poured out his life for you that you are forgiven, that you are his, that you are brought into his way of service and love, and you have his kingdom. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.